job a long time ago after college was to be a substitute preacher, as I called it, and I worked for the SBC. And what that meant is that if a pastor needed someone to fill in on short notice, they would call a number, and then that person would call me to come fill in if I could. So uh, I have done this before uh, on short notice, but uh, so that was kind of like my job for a while. Um, so I'm excited to do this. Uh, love being here, part of this body, so I'm happy to help in any way that I can this way. So uh, if you remember last time I preached was a couple years ago, I want to say it was during COVID, uh, I had been chronicling uh, my missing Bible. Um, it is a Bible that was absolutely glorious, okay? This thing was single column, you know what that means, verse by verse reference Bible, ESV, and it was premium calfskin, okay? We're talking top of the line stuff, and I had it, and that was my preaching Bible for the longest time, and then we were moving, and I had the bright idea, uh, because I'm a, you know, brilliant idiot here, I was going to not put it with the rest of my stuff because it was so important to me. So I put it somewhere where, because I didn't want thieves to be able to steal it if they stole our stuff. So I had it somewhere else, and that was 10 years ago, and I can't find it anywhere. And the reason why I mentioned that is that that Bible was so beautiful, it, it promised 10% more glory in all your sermons, and it's just not there. And so I've come to the decision that it just had to have, it's just gone. I have to let it go. I'm probably not going to find this Bible again. Uh, my best theory, my running theory, is that it has been raptured. It is in, currently in the Ark of the Covenant next to the tablets and the manna, and it's just there. That's the only explanation I have. So anyways, I apologize for the lack of Bible, um, so we'll, we'll, we'll try to get through this. But speaking of the Bible, uh, it brings us to our verses today. So if you would, we're going to go be in Mark 5. So if you guys would stand up as we read this together. So it's Mark 5, and we're going to be in verses 1 through 20. All right, Mark 5. So they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send him out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs and the herd, numbering about 2,000. They rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned into the sea. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country. And people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had had the legion sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what, they, what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they, begged, and they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with the demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he was had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in all the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. Let me pray. Father, we again just praise you uh, for your word, that we get to come together as a family, study it, learn from it. Uh, I do pray that, that you would speak to us, Father, that you would use your word to change our hearts and our minds, and that you would again just use me in whatever way you can. So... Thank you, and we pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right, so this passage is actually a favorite of mine. That's why I had it kind of ready to go. Um, but uh, I just love the setting, everything that's going on in this story here. Prior to this, okay, we have in Mark 4, the very end, Jesus calms a storm, okay? And so they're on this boat, storm comes out of nowhere on the Sea of Galilee, and they're terrified, and it says that Jesus 
wakes up from his nap that he was having in the middle of the storm, and he calms the storm. And at the very end there, in verse 41 of Mark chapter 4, it says the disciples, they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? So it's this beautiful picture, this realization that the disciples are having that something is special about Jesus, that the elements of this earth obey him. And they're marveling at that. And then right away we get to this story, which is about the supernatural side of things. And we see that Jesus is also conquering over that as well. So really cool story here. Um, so at Cornerstone here, we do preach verse by verse. That's what I'm going to do. It's called expository preaching, but if you're not used to that. We're just going to go verse by verse, study it together, just look at it. So first section I want to look at is verses one through five here. So they came to the sea, or they were on the sea, and they came to the Gerasenes, which is basically not Israel. Okay, they're crossing the sea. They're in a pagan land, all right? Uh, the Gerasene was known for, you know, as a Decapolis region. They had 10 cities. They were Roman rule. It was heavily influenced by Greek culture. That's who this was. Obviously, that's why there's a herd of pigs sitting there. Uh, you're not going to have pigs in Israel, all right? So they have that there, and... I just kind of like to set this, or like imagine in my head, I don't know what time it is when this is occurring. Um, I like to envision the sort of like the horror movie where it's like almost dawn and it's like there's fog everywhere, dead silent. And it says that as soon as he steps off the boat, there is a screaming pack of demons that meets him. I can't imagine how terrifying that would be. All right, think about the disciples. They were just terrified of a storm. So you're encountering these demons inside of this, there's actually two men, but inside of this man, and that would be absolutely terrifying. I can't imagine that, what that's like. And so they step off, and this guy is here. And it tells us a little bit about the man, one of the men. It says he lived, and I keep saying that because in Matthew he records that there's actually two men here. But in Mark, he's focusing on the one man, and that's important later. So this man comes to him, and it gives us a backstory. It says he lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. And it talks about unclean spirits, demons. Okay? And that's a topic that sometimes we get a little uncomfortable around, talking about these things. Uh, but I do think it's important for us to address them, number one, because it's, they're real. Yeah, there's nothing phony about this. Jesus encountered demons all the time. We encounter demons all the time. And whether you like to admit it or not, they're a part of our lives, okay, influencing things. And I say that because this is crucial for us, especially as we move forward in Acts as a body, to understand that this, this, we, we live in a supernatural world. Okay? We are not just materialists. Okay, we're not just flesh and blood in this room here. And it's important for us to know that as a church body that there is a supernatural side to these things. And that this story is a perfect example of it. Okay, so I don't want us to shy away from these things when we encounter them, but to understand it. I also don't want us to become obsessed with it. Not everything is the devil. Don't be like Bobby Boucher's mom and Waterboy. Okay, not everything is the devil. All right? But... There is a truth here that we are in a spiritual realm, okay? They do influence us at times, and that is part of our lives. And so here is a story where we encounter a demon, a literal demon, many of them actually, inside of a human being, okay? So I don't want us to shy away from that truth there. Also, this story tells us some truths about demons, okay? Look at how this man lives. He lived among the tombs. No one could bind him, not even with a chain. He has some sort of supernatural power here. He's often bound with shackles and chains, but he can break them apart, and no one has the strength to subdue him. Something weird about this guy is happening to him. And it says day and night he cries out and cuts himself with rocks. He lives in a tomb. This is not a good existence at all for this man. It's quite, it's a horrible existence, in fact. And that's one of the truths we learn here about demons is that they hate you. 
They despise you. They despise the image bearers of God. They want nothing but pain to inflict on your lives. That's it. Okay, so this Hollywood version we have of demons where they give people magical powers and they want them to succeed is not true. Okay, they want you living in a cave naked by yourself, cutting yourself, crying out all day in torment. That's what brings them joy. And that's what we're learning from the story here. Next section here. So that's the man that we have encountered here. Verse 6. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. I, I don't know why he does this. Right? There's, there's nothing that tells us why this happens. My personal theory is that demons, like everyone else at the end of time, will have no power but to bow before Jesus when they encounter him. It's almost like this involuntary spasm that even the demons have, that we will all have when we stand before Jesus, and you will have no choice but to bow. And we see this in Scripture elsewhere. In John, if you remember, when Jesus is being arrested, about to be crucified, they say, we're seeking Jesus. And Jesus says, I am he. And it says that everyone there, everyone, the people that betrayed him, the people there to arrest him, fall back and bow on their faces when he says that. It's this picture of authority, right? Jesus is in absolute control, and you have no choice but to bow. This idea that the world has that they're going to argue with God about their greatness before him, not going to happen. Their mouths will be shut, bowing before him. That's what happens to everyone at the end of time, okay? Okay? And we see that here. Again, I don't know if that's 100% true. It just matches with the rest of Scripture. He runs and falls down before him. Verse 7, And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. And in Matthew's account of this, he actually says that the demons say, Have you come to destroy us, for it is not your time? It's as if these demons have this understanding that they lose in the end. All right, and I say this not to be discouraging to us, but to show you our enemy. They know the scriptures better than you do. They understand, they have better theology than a lot of us. They know that Jesus is the most high God. Son of the most high God is what they say. They know that. They know that he's going to destroy them. And they know that he has the power to torment them. And these are his enemies. Like, think about that picture here. This is, these are the enemies of us, of God, and yet they know perfectly what's going to happen to them, and they know who they're in, who's ahead of them, who's above them in authority. So it's this amazing picture of God's sovereignty here just in what this demon says. And you again see this elsewhere in Scripture where the demons say that. They know exactly who Jesus is. And as this was happening, Jesus was saying, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked the man, what is your name? And he replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. So not only does this man have a demon, he's saying that he has many demons inside of him. Now, I have no clue how this works. I'm not even going to pretend to understand anything about the, the spiritual realm like that. I don't understand how there can be thousands of demons in some, someone. It right? doesn't make sense to me physically. But that's what this is saying here. It's saying there's many spiritual entities inside of this guy tormenting him. And that's the truth. And it's kind of shocking to think about that, that there could, that could be a situation going on today. All right, these demons didn't go anywhere. They, they, don't, they didn't run off the hill, drown, and just disappear. Jesus tells us that they actually search out other people when that happens. Okay, so still around, and this is possible. 
Now, verse 10, starting there in this section. Demons begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. They want to remain where they are. Okay, this is the Greek territory of the Decapolis. They want to be in that area for some reason. I don't know why. It says, A great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs. Let us enter them. So he gave them permission. Stop there for a second. Jesus has to give the demons permission to do this. Now, the idea of the sovereignty of God is a whole other sermon, well, multiple sermons, but um, I can't really focus on that today, but that is a crazy statement right there, a crazy fact. We see it in Job, right? Satan's wandering around, comes before, jo- or comes before God, and God's like, have you seen Job? He's like, yeah, he's great, um, but he only loves you for, because of all the stuff you've given him. And so Satan has to ask for permission to take away Job's stuff. So we see this concept in Scripture where somehow even the enemies of God have to ask for permission to do things, which again is a huge question of how does that work? Why does it work that way? Why does God allow it? I don't know. I'm not going to answer that question here. I wish I could. I wish I could tell you exactly why God allows these things but I cannot do that. That's not a promise in Scripture that we'll figure that out. But it's a truth that God actually does do things like that. He's allowing these things to happen. And Jesus allows these demons to enter in a herd of pigs. And what happens? The great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. They asked to go into them, so he gives them permission. The unclean spirits come out and enter the pigs And the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned into the sea. Picture that for a second. You're sitting there watching this happen, and there's a group of people watching this from the sideline. And the pigs, something stirs them up, and they just run straight into the ocean and drown and die. Why? Why the pigs? Why did they ask to go into the pigs? We don't know. We don't have a a scripture that tells us exactly why they wanted to do that. But we see the results of what happens. And it fits with our definition of, or not our definition, our description of demons. And that they hate you. They hate all of us. And so they want to go into the pigs because it's going to tick off the herdsmen. Right? Those are, that's their pigs that they just lost. That's a fortune that they just lost. And so they wanted to inflict pain on these herdsmen, and then the ending result is that these herdsmen kick Jesus out. They don't want these people knowing Jesus. It's my thoughts. Again, it seems to fit with the rest of Scripture. That's why the pigs. It has nothing to do with animals. Animals don't have spirits like us, nothing like that. It's simply because they hate us. They want to inflict as much pain as possible. Okay? Now, it says in verse 11 here, or sorry, verse 12, they begged him, and Jesus gave him permission to go into the pigs. John Calvin on this has a really great quote speaking on demons. He says, uh, demons have such a rage for mischief And they're always like a lion in search of prey. They are grieved at having no one to torment. Which is why they beg Jesus, don't send us away. We want to stay here, inflicting pain. That's their desire. And that's exactly what they did here on that. So, again, they wanted to go into the pigs to create mischief um, against God. Next little section here. There's the people that were watching, I mentioned. So, this is one of the saddest passages in Scripture, for sure. uh, Because we have these herdsmen who were watching this unfold. 
have seen this man, clearly, these two men, actually, who were always around, just cutting themselves, screaming. They see them now healed. And it says when they get there, instead of rejoicing at this, they're fearful. All right? They ran away, told it into the city, and the people came to see what had happened. They came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man in verse 15, the one who had the legion sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Verse 16, and those who had seen it described to them what, that, what had happened about the demon-possessed man and the pigs, and their reaction is to beg Jesus to go away. That's their response to this miracle. Begged him. Like the demons beg Jesus to not get sent away, they are begging Jesus to just go away. We don't want you here. That's the power of money and finances in our lives. It can control you. It can control you to the point where you're willing to reject God for the sake of your money and possessions. Again, we see that elsewhere in Scripture. Jesus to the rich man. What do I have to do to follow you? Just sell everything and come follow me. And he left away, went away sad. He couldn't do it. That's exactly this. They are ticked off that they just lost their fortune and they want God to get out of their face and go away. That's terrifying. That's terrifying because we as human beings can do that. That we can stand in front of God, be two feet away from him, curse him to his face, and then tell him to leave. And that, that's what happens. Every day that happens. Yeah. Verse 17, they begged him to leave, apart from their region. Again, just a horribly sad verse. There wasn't any celebration about this man. Nothing. Just get out of here, Jesus. We don't want you. I think that goes to show you that, again, this world has this picture of Jesus. I call him the hippie Jesus, where Jesus, if he were here today, man, everybody would love him. He would be the coolest guy in the world, and that is the furthest thing from the truth. If Jesus were here today, we would hate him just as much as they hated him here. Every single one of us, okay? Well, not every single, obviously we're believers. I mean, the world would hate him, okay? And it's the same concept. When Jesus died, he had exactly zero followers. Zero when he died. All of them went away. Everyone hated him for what he did. And it'd be the same thing today. We would ask him to get out of our face, leave us alone, and go away. That's what people would do. Okay? So don't believe again the Hollywood myths about this idea that, that Jesus would be the greatest person ever and we would all love him because it's not true. No. And then next section, verses 18 through 20, are some of the coolest verses in Scripture. I love this part. This is why I love this passage right here. Verse 18, as Jesus was getting in the boat, because he's you know, listening to these people, he's getting out of the country. As he's getting in the boat, one of the men who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. So notice the, the parallel here that is done on purpose in Scripture. The herdsmen beg Jesus to leave. The demons beg Jesus to send them somewhere else to increase their torment. This guy who's been healed begs Jesus to follow him. And that is such a beautiful part of this story here. Okay, do not lose that fact that it's meant to show you one person's begging him to leave, one person is begging to follow him. Such a beautiful part of this story. But Jesus, listen to what it says here, he did not permit him. It's Jesus. Again, there's a parallel there. He gave permission to the demons to go into the pigs. He permitted that. But this guy who wants to follow him, Jesus does not permit it. And so you go, why? Why is that, Jesus? He just wants to follow you. Why wouldn't you allow that? 
Why doesn't God answer your prayers at times? I don't know. But we have results that occur after this, okay? So this man doesn't get what he wants, because we often pray that. I pray that. Everyone prays what we want. But here, Jesus stops him and says, no, you're not going to get what you want here. Instead, what does he tell him to do? He says, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. He gives them a mission. Okay? That's what God does in our lives. When you actually wake up and see him, it's not about he becomes this magical genie that gives you everything you want. That's not how he works. What happens is you get recruited into this spiritual battle, and then you are given a job, a task to accomplish. And in all of our cases, it's to proclaim what God has done for us. And that's exactly what this man was given, the task to go and proclaim, not just anywhere, to go and proclaim in the Decapolis, the Greek culture, okay? This man, I I wish there was like a Jeopardy section here where it's like, question, who is the first foreign missionary? Answer this story right here. That's the first missionary to the world. This guy, that's the mission, the world. And we forget that in this story, that this is the first time he sends him away to the Greeks, to the Romans. And what does the guy do? He obeys. And he went away. He actually doesn't just obey the go tell your friends and family. No, no, no. It says he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. And that's the end of this guy's story. I don't know what happens to him. He's not an axe. Doesn't show up, right? In heaven, can't wait to meet this guy to see his adventures, right? What did he do? What happened? Was he persecuted? I don't know. But it's a beautiful story. That's what happens. Sends him away, and he doesn't just do the bare minimum. He actually has a desire to then go and speak to the intellectually superior Greeks and Romans and tell them about Jesus. And that's such an amazing miracle that occurs in this story. Uh, When I was thinking up this sermon, um, I was working on it last night. A lot of different angles you can take on this, obviously. So, talked about the spiritual side, how it's really important for us to understand this, guys. We do not fight against flesh and blood. Okay? There is a spiritual realm that exists, and if it makes you uncomfortable, you have to understand it is the truth. We are in a spiritual battle. There are angels, there are demons, there's Satan. There are forces against you that you cannot see. We are not just materialists. Okay? We have to understand that. You have to believe that. That's what we see in Scripture everywhere. There is a spiritual component to this. I don't know if you guys have ever encountered a demon. Okay? Um, I did one time for sure. I know I did. It was when I was in college. Um, in college, I had just become a believer. I was really arrogant. I know it's hard to believe. Arrogant, bold, brash, young, healthy, vibrant. Um, I was leading a Bible study on campus, and we had a, a, it was a really nice day, so we went to McDonald's right there on King Avenue, if you're familiar, um, in the Olentangy section. And we were at this McDonald's, sitting there, studying our Bibles. We all had our Bibles out. And this homeless woman comes up, and she's like making noises to herself, And she just looks right at me, and she goes, if you say another word, I'll kill you. Dead serious. Death in her eyes. And me being the arrogant fool that I was, I said, excuse me? (laughs) Because you're invincible at that age when you're in college. So she goes off. We're still having our study. Later on, she comes back out. All right. She does this weird thing where she starts hugging me. Kind of strange. And then she, they, she, you know, she gets kicked out by the manager or whatever. So she's just standing there. So I'm like, I need to go talk to this lady. Okay? And I'm telling you, like, the lady who I was talking with, there was something off about her. 
Okay, you can see it in their eyes. The second I go up to her, she, before I even get there, it was like I was talking to a different human being. It was the weirdest thing I've ever experienced. You know when it says in Scripture, something like scales fall from their eyes. That's exactly what happened with the woman. And she looks at me and she goes, how could anyone ever love me? Never forget that. So, I was about to launch in to the good news, the gospel, and the manager comes and shoves her out of the way, says, get out of here, I called the cops. Second, I'm about to do that. She just broke my heart. Because we lost one that day. We lost her. And that's what Scripture says. They hate us. Do you understand that? They don't want this woman to know the truth at all. They want her wandering around the streets. That's what they want. Just like they wanted this guy. Wandering around, crying out for help. They hate you. I cannot express that enough. There's a movie that's out recently. Um, it's called uh, Nefarious. We got together as a Bible study and watched it. And I was blown away by the movie because it depicts this so well. It depicts the idea that the demon's goal is to inflict pain and harm on people. That's what they want to do. And that movie, I highly recommend it just for that aspect of it. You'll see that very clear. And that's exactly what they did in this man's life. That's what they've done in that woman's life. And they keep doing it. And you have to hate it. It has to drive you crazy. Okay? Because that's the mission we're on. We are encountering these spiritual things. This happens. This will continue to happen. You will probably meet someone who has a thousand demons inside of them. And if that sounds, and that makes you cringe, I'm sorry. That's the truth of Scripture. It's possible. It's not saying it happens every time, but it is definitely possible. And so that's what we have to look at and know when we're reading our Scripture and when we're encountering this world. There is a spiritual side to it. The second part to this is the man himself. And, and I mentioned there are two men here. That's what blows me away. Matthew's account says there are two demon-possessed men that were at these tombs. One of them comes to Jesus. The other one just runs away, excited to be healed. We see that elsewhere in Scripture as well. Right? He heals two lepers, or I forget how many lepers. He heals them, and only one comes back to praise him, because that's our lives. Miracles can happen to people, and they can just say, thank you, God, and run away the opposite way. Keep headed down the same exact path. But this man saw the truth, wanted to be with him, wanted to follow him. Just an amazing picture here of the reality of what can occur. And so, that's this man. And so my question to you, okay, who is that man in your life? Who is the person that when you look at their life, you're like, there is no way they could be a missionary for God. No way. They would be my last pick for a missionary for God. Who is that person? Think about that today. And then how can you pray for them? Do you believe that a miracle can occur in their lives where they can repent and be radically different as a human being? Is that something you believe? Because it is in Scripture everywhere. That's what God has done with every single one of us in this room who follows Him. We were the naked ones, ashamed, hurting ourselves, oppressed by thousands of things, and He rescued us. That's who we are as believers. And He can do the same exact thing in anybody's life. When I did this sermon originally, it was you know, a decade ago, and I used to play the I Am Second video of the leads, or not lead singer, the basis for Corn. If you ever seen it, amazing. You can search it on YouTube. I Am Second, Brian Welsh is his name. But it's this dude who's just covered in tattoos, dreadlocks, and he was, his life was spiraling out of control on drugs, whatever else. It's just out of control. And he says that his banker, of all people, looked at him and just said, hey man, are you okay? So I asked. And he said, no, I'm not okay. 
and he gave him a verse. He just said, hey man, something that helps me is this idea of like Jesus says, come to me all who are weary, heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. That's all he said. And it, he went home, started Google searching the Bible, totally transformed his life by a simple word. Scripture. That's it. Just when you see someone struggling, just ask them if they're okay. It's that simple. You do not have to be a theologian to proclaim the truth to people. That's not a requirement of God. In fact, the first missionary in history was a dude who 10 minutes ago was demon-possessed by a thousand demons. That's the requirement. It's just that we would follow Jesus. Just listen and obey. That's our requirement. And that's what you can do in your life. So again, I challenge us, who is this person in your life that you can do this, that you can pray for, that you can believe will transform? That's, our, that's my goal for you guys to think about this week. In closing, uh, we get together every week and we do communion and we talk about how much Jesus has done for us. The sacrifice. All right? And that's exactly what Jesus commands this man to do, is go tell people that, how much he's done for you. And that's what we're doing by proclaiming that, by taking the bread and the juice. We are proclaiming what he has done for us here. All right? And so that is a beautiful picture. So every time we take this, we gather, we take it, because we're remembering that sacrifice. Let me pray for us. Father, uh, we just praise you for your word. Um, the truth that you can transform anybody's life. The truth that you are in total control of everything that happens, even despite what the results might look like. And so we just pray to trust you, number one, and we pray to think about who we can be praying for. Father, who is the person that needs you the most? And so we just pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen.